السلام عليكم ورحمة الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وفضل الصلاة وتم التسليم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحب أجمعين سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت الحكيم العليم اللهم انشر علينا رحمتك وانزل علينا حكمتك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام I hope everyone is doing well. Uh, we got you guys coming here back to back days. <laughs> I know many of you were here last night, so it's only been a few hours. But this is a great reward of praying. Forget about the, the programs, just praying Salat al Aisha in the Masjid and then praying Fajr again. So it's a great reward. And then we're also going to pray Salat al Duha, inshallah. So you're going to get, you know, it's like, it's like doing your own private Umrah, inshallah. Um, so we're con- so we're going to continue the story of Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam. Today's discussion is based on Surat As-Safat. It's a very famous story between Ibrahim and his son. I know you know it. That's why we're going to go through that part quickly, and then I'm going to give you some information, um, especially about Al-Hajj al-Aswad, about the black stone that might be something new, like similar to what we did last week about talking about the well of Zamzam. Uh, As you know, last week we talked about the story of Ibrahim and Hajar leaving. um, So, of course, as you know, Ibrahim, he left his wife Hajar and Ismail in the desert. And this was the first test that Allah had for Ibrahim with his children. This is the test of leaving them, basically deserting them in the desert. And so it was very difficult for him, and it must have been even more difficult for Hajar to experience that and to have trust that Allah is going to take care of them. Now today we're talking about the second and a much greater test. It's a direct test, which comes only after Ismail alayhi salam becomes older and more mature. Now this is an important point because we already know the anticipation that Ibrahim had. I mean, he was uh, 85 years old and without a child. And then um, he gets married and uh, a second time. And now they're pregnant and he's 86 years old. And finally he has a child. Now years passed and, and his son gets older. But he's not just an ordinary child. Over time, the righteousness of that child becomes established and proven. Here you have a young man. He's young, he's fit, he's strong, he's devout, he's a muttaqi, he's God-fearing, he's loving, he's everything that a parent dreams of in a child. Everything that a father could ask for, every attribute that a father might uh, pray for and look for in a son, he finds that in Ismail. So it is the true fulfillment of all of his prayers. And here he is this doting father. He's so attached to his son. Not just by virtue of the fact that he's his son, but just by virtue of also his prophethood. Because Ismail is not a prophet yet, but his father is, and he sees all of those qualities that just as he's calling to Allah, his son is also following in the same footsteps. Right? in terms of righteousness, in terms of his character. Then in the midst of all of that, and also there's the separation, by the way, because Ibrahim is traveling back and forth. Right, He's coming from between Canaan and Iraq, and he's coming to Arabia. This is no joke. I mean, the, the distance that he's going through um, is, is exhausting. But he's fulfilling what Allah had commanded him to do. And then he receives out of nowhere this great order. And he sees, إِنِّي أَرَى فِي الْمَنَامِ أَنِّي أَذْبَحُكَ So he sees a vision of himself slaughtering his son Ismail. And this is a great, البلاء المبين. This is a great test. Um, And he's in an extremely difficult position, right? But as a Nabi, he had no option other than saying Sama'an wa ta'a, that we hear and we obey. Meaning, and some people might ask, well, it's a dream. Where's the order? 
But the dream is, a, a, which is actually a ru'ya, which is actually a vision of a Nabi, of a prophet, is a command. Right? So their dreams are true. They will not dream anything which is falsehood. And so that order has to be implemented. And every Eid, maybe for decades you've heard the same uh, Eid khutbah, right? We try to, you know, at ICP we sprinkle it with some extra masala, right? Make it interesting, we add some new stuff. But normally, you know, on the day of Eid, you hear the same story, right? In which you commemorate the willingness of Ibrahim to sacrifice his son, if that's indeed Allah's will. It also appears in the Hebrew Bible, in the Old Testament of the... Uh, of the Bible as well. It's a story of sacrifice, obedience, it's a story of devotion to Allah's will, but also it's a story between a father and a son. I mean, just at its basic level, right? This is a very stressful, difficult uh, case in which the, the strong bond and relationship between the father and the son, their trust and uh, reliance and dependence on each other is revealed. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said, فَلَمَّا بَلَغَ مَعَهُ السَّعْيَ قَالَ يَا بُنَيَّ قَالَ يَا بُنَيَّ إِنِّي أَرَى فِي الْمَنَامِ أَنِّي أَذْبَحُكَ فَانْظُرْ مَاذَا تَرَى قَالَ يَا أَبَتِ فَعَلْ مَا تُؤْمَرُ سَتَجِدُنِي إِنْ شَاءَ اللَّهُ مِنَ الصَّابِرِينَ And when he reached with him the age of exertion. فَلَمَّا بَلَغَ مَعْهُ السَّعِي So now it's not like, he's not a young kid. I mean he has reached the age of strength and maturity. And he says, O oh my son, يَا بُنَيْ O oh my dear son, Indeed, I have seen in a dream that I must sacrifice you. And this is interesting because he could have, you know, waited for him to like turn, you know, in a corner and just like kind of get him from the back, right? So he, do, he doesn't notice, he doesn't have to deal with that awkwardness of telling his son what he's going to do. He didn't need to involve him in the decision making, right? Because the order was to him. So he could have just carried it out. But instead, he tells him directly, man to man, فَانْظُرْ مَاذَا تَرَى Right? This is also a good lesson for fathers, you know, and for parents to involve their kids in decision making, discuss things, right? So we learn a lesson about communication here as well. He says, Ma that tara? That what do you think? I mean, this is a this is the definition of an open ended question, right? And most of us we're very bad at open ended questions, right? We you know we we give a question that can only answer be answered is yes and no. Right? It's like kind of push someone in a corner or we guilt trip them. But here he says, Ma that tara? What do you think? Completely open ended. So just tell me your thoughts. And then he says, Ya abati. Can you imagine somebody telling you, I'm going to kill you? I mean, what would your reaction be? Your reaction would be like, <laughs> you know, oh, look over there and then you run, right? <laughs> like, take cover. But instead he says, Ya abati. Oh, my dear father, right? An expression of endearment. And not only does he accept, this is beyond acceptance, he affirms Allah's command. If fa'al, he uses, since we've been doing all the Arabic since yesterday, so we'll continue, bismillah. He, says, he uses which form of the verb? He says, do as you are commanded. What kind of verb is that? This is command, imperative, that's right. If'al ma tu'mar, this is sighat al-amr. Do as you have been commanded. Not because Ibrahim was going to disregard what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, but he wanted his father to know that he had his complete confidence, right? Do as you are commanded. Satajiduni, insha'Allah, min as You will find me, if Allah wills, of the steadfast, right? So he immediately surrendered. He didn't have a second thought. There was no time to think. He immediately said, If al do as you have been commanded. So then the two of them they slip away, they look for a good place. Most importantly, they're looking for a place away from mom, right? Because uh, I mean I'm sure that can be a little bit distressing. 
while they're on their way, Shaitan comes to Ibrahim. And, you know, and Shaitan, he's always at the scene when there's a problem, right? Husband and wife are, are crying. That's his favorite, right? Yahulu bayn al mar'i wa zawji, right? So Shaitan, you know the hadith in which he brings all of his shayateen, right? They have a big convention, right? Gathering. This is described in the hadith, more than one, but especially in that one. And one person, he's like, I made somebody kill. He's like, oh, you, you haven't done anything. Another person is like, oh, I made somebody steal something. Oh, no, no, okay, that's fine, but no big deal. I, I can do that before breakfast, right? But then one person is like, oh, but I made a husband and a wife argue. Then shaitan is like, okay, here's the reward. <laughs> you know, and Here's the award because that is the foundation of the society, right? And... Uh, so Shaitan, he comes to Ibrahim and he tells Ibrahim. So Shaitan, of course, he always comes in the most tense moments. So we should also be aware of that. That when we're in the most stressful situations, when we have the most pressure, when everybody's looking at us what to do, when we're in situations that require patience, uh, where we have to respond not in anger, but with wisdom, just be aware of inna shaytana lakum adu. That shaitan is your enemy, take him as an enemy. So if you have that level of awareness, then in the moment you're going to say, wait a minute. This is from the waswasa of shaitan. This is the whispering of shaitan. You will immediately diffuse that situation because of that awareness. But if you're not aware, then it enters into your thought process unknowingly. And then you start to think, oh, well, this is how I'm feeling, right? So that's part of shaitan's trickery. The talbis of Iblis is that he'll make you feel a certain way. Not directly, but through altering how you think about it. When you alter how you think about it, it alters how you feel about it. And then when you change how you feel about it, then you're going to make different decisions. So shaitan, he does that classic, you know, this is shaitan 101. He comes and he shows up and he comes to Ibrahim and he says, Ibrahim, do you really think God wants you to kill your son? Right? Some of us, we start thinking, like, oh, well, God does really need us to pray, right? Or, you know, why, why, why does God want us to, to do this? You know, it doesn't hurt anybody, right? So shaitan is whispering to him that, is, you know, are you really going to do this? And then, of course, he goes for the low-hanging fruit, which is, well, it was just a dream. It could have been just like a silly dream. Come on, you're just your own imagination. Like, are you sure that you really saw that? When Ibrahim hears that, he takes stones and he throws them at shaitan. So shaitan is like, okay, well, this is not happening. So then he moves on to Ismail and he does the same thing. And Ismail immediately casts him with rocks. Um, and then he ultimately, in the third instance, comes to both of them when they're together. And the two of them both throw stones. So uh, many of you, when I mention this, this is going to sound very familiar. Because these are part of the manasik of Hajj. As uh, Dr. Tariq mentioned yesterday, last night, these are from the Sha'a'il. These are from the rituals and the symbols of Allah. And in the Hajj, we commemorate that. When you attempt, once you have resolved to do something for the sake of Allah, don't deviate. Be firm, be strong, and resolute. There are people, they. They say, I'm going to study Bukhari. I'm going to memorize the Quran. It could be something simple. I'm going to read one page of Quran per day. I'm going to recite the adhkar of the morning. Right? Whatever the case might be. Right? Once you have made that decision, be completely determined to carry that out. Don't allow... So like, you know, from day one, be aware that things are going to come in your way. And so just have your eyes on the prize. Um, and so now they, okay, they've, they've, they've passed the, the test of shaitan. Then they reach this big rock. They're, I mean, well, they're looking for a big rock that's suitable for this purpose. And Ismail, he's concerned for his father. So he directs his father. He said, oh, my father, turn my face away from you, down towards the ground. So when you look at me, you won't experience any sympathy. So you won't even hesitate for a moment. You won't think about not carrying out Allah's order. He says, turn around, sharpen your knife, 
Be quick and continue with Allah's order. So what is Ismail thinking about? He is concerned for his father's well-being. He's not even thinking about himself. He's thinking about how distressful it must be for his father to be in this position. Then Allah says in Surah the Safat, فَلَمَّا أَسْلَمَا وَتَلَّهُ لِلْجَبِينَ And when they had both submitted and he put down upon his forehead, وَنَادَيْنَاهُ أَيَّا إِبْرَاهِيمُ We call to him, O Ibrahim. Right? So here Ismail is there. He's literally facing death, staring it down. And as, as I mentioned, um, well, actually we didn't mention, but in, according to our sources, this is most likely Ismail alayhi salam. The name is not mentioned in the Quran, which is interesting because there's lots of places where Allah could just say who it was, right? Um, but Allah does not mention the son by name. However, we know that by the chronology and the sequence, we know for sure, and this is actually affirmed by a lot of the historical records, that it is Ismail. And that's because after that, Allah says, وَبَشَّرْنَاهُ بِإِسْحَاقَ Nabiya. So after the story ends, then he said, oh, and we gave him good news of Ishaq, which is one of the consequences of him passing this exam, right? Is that he is blessed with Ishaq. So Ishaq is a gift, uh, among other reasons, because of the devotion of Ibrahim. So because of the sequence of events, we know that it's mine, but why, why doesn't Allah mention it? For Muslims, and this is my theory, Allah knows best, which is that the reason it's, even though we know it's Ismail, the reason the name is not mentioned is because it, for us it doesn't really matter. Whether it is Ismail or it is Ishaq, then the story is the same. If Ishaq had been in the, that position, he would have reacted the same way. And Ibrahim alayhi salam, his love for Ismail and love for Ishaq was both strong. And so it would have been a similar test in both cases. But especially the, the test was strong in the case of Ismail because he had been in anticipation of having a son so much. So in that way, the test was greater. As opposed to somebody who has two sons, not to say that they wouldn't care, right? For those of you that are middle children, I hope I'm not triggering anything. Right? Um, but, you know, it's different from in this case in which it's the only child. Allah alam. So here he is, he's committed to fulfilling the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even if it means the ultimate sacrifice. And so Ismail, he's ready to put down his life, his family, everything. So this is also a good life lesson for us. That just as how we have to pout shaitan, there are going to be moments in which we need to put everything on the line. In which our dunya we pursuits have to be subservient to our ukhrawi goals. Right? That if we want to be successful, we have to be willing to give up the things that we're attached to. So they both surrendered, and now he has this sharp knife on his neck. And every time that Ibrahim is ready to you know, press on the knife, the knife spins, and it turns on the other side. So it's not cutting, right? And this is a reminder, like we mentioned before, when they threw Ibrahim into the fire, then Allah says, Ya Naru, kuni bardan wa salaman ala Ibrahim. Be cool and gentle on Ibrahim. Because the fire couldn't burn without Allah's will. Similarly, the knife is not going to cut without Allah's will. The oceans don't drown people without Allah's will. Right? So, there is the one that is causing everything to happen. Then he was replaced with a ram from paradise. بِذِبْحٍ عظيم. right? So Allah says, Ya Ibrahim, قَدْ صَدَّقُتَ الرُّؤْيَةِ You pass the test, flying colors. Ask whatever you want. So as we mentioned in the Israeli text, it's mentioned that the Prophet and the son was Ishaq. Right? But this is not possible. Because also it happened in Mecca. This is the second uh, reason. So in the verses in the Quran right after this, Allah says we gave him 
Good news. So then the order comes down to build a house as a symbol of Tawheed. Right? And this is the same foundation of a house, but not exactly the Kaaba that we know that was built by Adam. In awwala baytin Right? So this is the original house established for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we say Baytullah, the house of Allah, this is not, this is idafa to tashrif, right? So this is the house that belongs to Allah. It's different. When I say my house, it means like the house that I live in. Right? When we say Baytullah, it means something different. But intuitively, we all know that, right? Um, so the order comes down. This is to serve as a simple of Tawheed, the unity of Allah Azza wa Jal. So Ibrahim, he comes down to the valley. This is a, another instance. I mean, can you imagine if he had frequent flyer miles? I mean, Ibrahim would be like, of like platinum status or something. I mean, he's back and forth all over the world traveling. And he comes in a different trip to the valley and he mentions that he has an order. And of course, same thing, you know, do uh, your father, do what you've been ordered to do. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he describes, um, and I think this is uh, in Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah alam. Allah says, وَإِذْ يَرْفَعُ إِبْرَاهِيمُ الْقَوَاعِدَ مِنَ الْبَيْتِ وَإِسْمَعِيلُ رَبَّنَا تَقَبَّلْ مِنَّا إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ Yeah, Surah Al-Baqarah. And remember when Ibrahim raised the foundation of the house with Ismail, both praying, Rabbana taqabbal minna. You've heard me say this. We, we mention this dua all the time. Our Lord, accept this from us. And you are indeed the all-hearing, the all-knowing. So notice how they begin their action with asking for qabul, asking for acceptance. So this is a form of renewing their intention, right? And so, you know, um, one of the things that my daughter taught me when she was in first grade, she came back, I was like, what did you learn today um, in the beginning of school? And she was like, begin with the end in mind. So I was like, mashallah, this is a great, great lesson. I'm going to use that in the masjid. Begin with the end in mind, right? And this reminds me of the hikmah from Ibn Ata'illah, which we didn't reach yet which is that one of, one of the signs of acceptance in the end is remembering Allah in the beginning. So a sign of it, Allah's acceptance in the end is remembering Allah in the beginning. So if you're doubtful, like, did I do it for the sake of Allah? Did I do it for people? You know, we all have our doubts. Like, is it sincere? Then go back and think about it. That when I, when I first did it, was I thinking about Allah or was I thinking about something else? If in that moment you're like, no, no, no. إِنَّمَا نُطَعِمُكُمْ لِوَجْهِ اللَّهِ We were just doing charity and helping people for the sake of Allah. So that's a sign. Rest assured, Allah will accept it. Don't allow those doubts to, to, to you know, permeate. Okay. <coughs> so then they start to get high. And Ibrahim is getting bricks and rocks for Ismail. So Ismail is the one placing everything. And Ibrahim is the one bringing the bricks. And it's like a jigsaw puzzle. There's no mortar, and they have to fit each one precisely. So it fits in the exact position uh, in that pattern. And then they suddenly discovered that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala miraculously caused the stone that he was standing on to go higher. And then to adjust lower, then to go higher according to the level that they need. And of course, they, they witnessed that this must be help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because this is his house. And when the house was built, they wanted to place an exact stone to fit perfectly. They wanted something that would be flush with the corner. And the two of them couldn't find it. And then Ismail, he comes back and he finds that there is a beautiful polished stone, right? That's in that corner. What's this? So Ibrahim tells him, that Allah has sent me a rock from Al Jannah. Today, we what do we know that rock as? Right, we know that as Al Hajar Al Aswad, the black stone. But actually, its origin was it black? No, it was white. That's right. It was originally white, but due to the sins of the people that have come, 
and you know by 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 virtue of their devotion to this and connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it can be a means of forgiveness but because of the sins that they have brought to it so it has been blackened from that now it's a lot smaller now than it was originally it has been shrink uh, the edges have been reduced it's fallen down some areas have been stolen and so it has continued to get smaller and smaller but there's still the eight pieces that are in there and there's a type of cement that holds those eight pieces together. And so the rock that at the end that they were standing on, it softened for a moment and his footprint was left in there. And so if you go there now, they have that glass in Maqam Ibrahim, they have a glass case. And so you're able to walk up to it and you can look through the glass and you can see the footprints that are left there. So let's talk a little bit about Al Hajj Al Aswad because I find this stuff really fascinating, right? Um, so there's a geologist, his name is Anthony Hampton, and some other geologists from Oxford. They wanted to study it. Now, it's not that easy to study it because it's in the Kaaba. So what you, you're not, you're not going to start drilling holes and you know, taking samples and whatnot. But what they did find, they found that there were, uh, there's iridium in it, and there are shatter cones that are found in the bedrock, right? which, according to him, is similar to the meteorite impact craters. So this is one theory. We're going to go through a few different theories. There are eight pieces now. Um, the largest uh, is the size of a, of, a, of a date. So they're pretty small pieces. Now there are also six additional pieces that are believed in uh, to be located in Turkey. And of course, that's a long story how it got there. Uh, we'll talk about it in just a moment. And so a lot of non-Muslim researchers, they have theorized. For many years, there was a theory that it's coming from al-Rub al al-Khali, right? So as you know, in, in, in the Arabian Peninsula, all the towns come in the coastal side. And then there's the strip between Riyadh from Bahran, Dammam, uh, Riyadh, and then going towards Jeddah. So there are two rings. All of the population in Saudi Arabia exists in two lines. The rest of the country is completely empty, right? And then if you go north or east of that, right, these two rings, it's just completely, totally empty. That's the desert, right? So it's not like the desert that you've seen when you go to Mecca and Medina. It's like a desert, small, you know, small D, right? When you go there, it's like the real desert, right? So they're saying it's from there because there's a lot of igneous rock, right? Which means that it's caused by a volcanic rock. Um, so there they found blocks of silica glass, they've seen this uh, gas-filled hollows. And the reason they're looking for that kind of stone is because, in the instance we're going to mention in a moment, in which Al-Hajj al Aswad was removed, one of the reports that, that, uh, that were made was that Al-Hajj al Aswad was able to float in the water. That means its density is less than that of water. Right. It has to be in order to be able to float, and also that it doesn't get hot in fire. So we find that actually in impact craters, what they call like an impactite, right? So when you have a meteorite, so then the stone that's around it, it has that iridium, it has those shatter cones, right? It, it has air hollows within it that reduces its density, allows it to float, and not to get hot. Now, as the Muslim in me, I'm like, well, that can't be right, because it's not the impact, right? It's the meteorite itself, right? If we say that it's from Al-Jannah, so that's a form of like a meteorite. That's Allah Alam. So this is the discussion among geologists. Others, they said, no, 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 it's just a regular agite, you know, um, uh, stone. Uh, a lot of us, we have our sibha, the tasbih, the stone one. It's made from the same kind of stone. Um, or people in the Middle East, they have rings with the same type of stone, uh, which is a volcanic type of stone. Now, the reason that all of these geologist theories are not working are because they don't match the carbon dating. When they have uh, tried to date, all of this volcanic material exists way too recently. It was not there at the time period that we're talking about, so the theory kind of fails. It doesn't make sense. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the storyline 
right? It said that it was struck and it was smashed into pieces by a stone that was flung by catapult during the Umayyad Khalifa's siege of Mecca in 683. Anybody know about that? So Abdullah ibn Zubair, right, as you know, he declared that he's the Khalifa. Right? So during, so as you know, uh, we talked a little bit about uh, Al-Hasan and Muawiyah uh, in last week's event, right? So the deal with Al-Hasan, the grandson of the Messenger وسلم, and Muawiyah, there was, I think, 11 points in their agreement. And so the main point was like, the son Yazid was not supposed to be the, khali the Sultan, right? So that was part of the agreement. But as you know, they reneged on that. And so Yazid declared uh, himself the leader or the Khalifa. At the time, they didn't use the word Sultan. They used the word Khalifa. But nobody recognized Yazid initially at all. I mean, it was, it was at least, I want to say, 10 years. Um, and then by the time he kind of got recognized, he passed away suddenly, right? Um, and so during that period, the Umayyad, see, they did a siege. This is Yazid when he's young. Right? There's a siege of Mecca in the year 683. And the Kaaba actually, part of it burns down. Right? Because the Kaaba itself is destroyed. There have been a lot of nonsense that's happened over the years. right? Um, and so as a result of that, there was a stone catapult. right? Um, they were able to subdue Medina later on the second time. And then Mecca as well. But we're talking about the first time. Now that stone struck the black stone. And so from what we know, at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, the black stone was still one solid piece. But it was only a few years later that because of that stone hitting it, it broke, it, so it's, all the pieces are there, but it broke into different pieces. And then the fragments were joined by Abdullah ibn Zubair, who as you know, he declared himself Khalifa in Mecca, I think it was for eight, nine years that he was there, using a silver kind of ligament um, to join it together. Then in January of 930, then it was stolen by the Qaramitin, uh, who carried, um, they're another weird group, right? They carried the black stone away to their base in Eastern Arabia. I guarantee most Muslims don't know this that the black stone was completely stolen. And literally there was just an empty space where the black stone is for years. And then according to the Ottoman historian Qutbuddin, he's writing in 1857, he said their leader, the uh, Abu Tahir al-Jannabi, and this is a group, the Qaramitin, these are the, uh, their militant Ismaili, Shia group, right? So out of the Shia, then there's a small group of Ismailis, and then out of the Ismailis, there's an even smaller group. These are very extreme, militant group that happen in Islamic history. They don't exist anymore at all, right? So they set up the black stone in their own masjid, which people knew as Masjid Abdirar, right? Because that's the same thing that happened during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with the intention of redirecting the Hajj away from Mecca and I'm like seriously the same story again everybody keeps there Abraha tried the same thing did anybody go to Abraha's temple no people keep going for the Hajj let it go guys but they're trying again they said we're gonna everybody's gonna come to our message because we have the black stone nobody came it didn't work because people would honor, even with the black stone missing, they would honor the place that the black stone was. And they would continue to do their tawaf, Bismillah, Allahu Akbar, and you know, business as usual. According to the famous historian Al Juwaini, Imam Al Juwaini, the stone was returned 23 years later in 952. So for 23 years, there is no black stone, right? And that group, the Qaramita, uh, they held the black stone for ransom. And they forced the Abbasid Khalifa to pay a huge sum in order to ransom it to get returned back. And finally, they negotiated a deal, right? But instead of just returning it like normal people would, they put it in a sack and they threw it into the 
Friday Masjid in Al Kufa, the Jama' Masjid in Kufa, in Iraq, and they literally wrote it down, wrote down a note. You know, talk about passive aggressive. Right? They put in the note. They said, "By command, we took it, and by command, we have brought it back." So they they, they finally returned it. You know, in their weird way. Now, because it had been transported and abducted and removed, then it caused it further damage, right? So the stone is now in seven total pieces. And according to Qutbuddin, the same Ottoman uh, historian, he said that as a result, the filthy Abu Tahir, he's the leader of this crazy group, right? He says he was afflicted by gangrene. So he has this gangrenous sore. His flesh was completely eaten out by worms. And he died a most terrible death. I mean, he was literally eaten by worms to death. So, you know, he had a bad ending, right? And as, as Dr. Tariq mentioned, we don't rejoice in the suffering of anybody, but, you know, Allah takes care of some people, right? To protect this uh, shattered stone, then the custodians of the Kaaba, they commission a pair of goldsmiths in Mecca to build a silver frame around it. And if you go there today, since this year of 953 or whatever the year I gave you, um, 952, it has been enclosed within the silver frame, right, in order to protect it. And then in the <coughs> uh, 11th century, there was a man that was sent, allegedly of course, by the Fatimid uh, Khalifa, Al-Hakim, that tried to smash the black stone but it's reported that when he smashed it and tried to break the black stone, that he died on the spot, right? And he only caused slight damage to, to the black stone. So this has been historically recorded among other incidents, um, you know. And there are other incidents of somebody coming, you know, who is most likely non-Muslim that tried to put excrement and, you know, uh, people have tried to destroy the black stone in the past but they haven't been successful. So this brings us to one of the last few points, which is, you know, why is it that we revere this black stone in the first place? It's just a stone. I mean, we don't worship stones. Isn't the whole point of Islam that we worship God, not stones? Right? We're trying to get away from idols. Right? And why is it that touching it is expiation for the sins? Now, Umar ibn al-Khattab, he asks the same question, and he answers it in the same statement. He comes to kiss the stone, and he's in a big assembly gathering of the Sahaba, right? And this is after the passing of the Messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And he says to everyone, he says, "No doubt, I know that you are a stone, and you can neither harm nor can you benefit anyone. Had I not seen the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, kissing you, I would not have kissed you." Now there are a thousand lessons from this statement. I mean, this is an unbelievable statement. Uh, it shows that we're not superstitious. We don't just do stuff because we saw people do it. It shows that we, you know, a lot of the things that Muslims do about touching and tabarruk and this is nonsense, right? You know, that, that we're, it's not just about being in the right place and the right people and this and that, but that things have real meaning. It also means that we shouldn't just make it up. We should, the best example, is that which the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has left us. Then there's another lesson which is that sometimes we won't understand the Sunnah. We won't understand things in religion. And you know it might not comport with our own logic and reason, but because we have confidence that there is a reason, we emulate the example of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, among many other lessons. Now in the Hadith collection, Kanzul Ummal, so that first part is very authentic. Statement from Umar, right? It's not something from the Prophet, but it's from Umar. It's also related in another hadith collection that Ali Karamallahu Ajal responded to Umar in the same gathering. And he said, This stone, Hajj al Aswad, can indeed benefit and harm. Allah says in the Quran that He created human beings from the progeny of Adam and made them wa ashhadahum and that he made them witness over themselves and he asked them that primordial question before we entered into this world alastu bi rabbikum am i not your creator upon this we all affirmed we said bala shahidna so we all confirmed it 
Thus Allah wrote down this covenant. That confirmation was recorded in the form of a writing. And this stone has a pair of eyes, ears, and a tongue, and it opens its mouth upon the order of Allah, who put that confirmation in it in order to witness it to all those worshippers who fed for Hajj. So according to the opinion, <clears throat> and we do not have this from the Messenger وسلم, but this is his view, and of course his, his view is based on some knowledge and information, <clears throat> is that that covenant between humanity and Allah was recorded in writing, and then it was fed to the black stone. So when we revere the black stone, it is a way of reminding ourselves of that original covenant to not worship other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and our divine purpose. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, <clears throat> now the Kaaba is intact, it's complete. Allah says, وَإِذْ جَعَلْنَا الْبَيْتَ مَثَابَةً لِلنَّاسِ وَأَمْنًا وَاتَّخِذُوا مِنْ مَقَامِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ مُصَلَّى وَعَهِدْنَا إِلَىٰ إِبْرَاهِيمَ وَإِسْمَعِيلَ أَنْ طَهِّرَا أَنْ تَهْرَى بَيْتِيَ لِلطَّائِفِينَ وَالْعَاكِفِينَ وَالْرُكِّعِ السُّجُودِ And remember when we made the sacred house a center and a sanctuary for people saying, you may take the standing place of Ibrahim as a site of prayer. And we entrusted Ibrahim and Ismail to purify my house for all of those who circle it and those who meditate in it, those who bow and those who prostrate themselves in prayer. <clears throat> Don't we do exactly that? وَاتَّقِذُوا مِنْ مَقَامِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ Musalla. So we pray, we physically pray at the standing place of Ibrahim. And the imprint is present there today. And then Ibrahim was told that you have built the house, so now call the people to visit it. So this is beautiful. We have this wonderful Kaaba in the middle of nowhere. No GPS, no, <laughs> there's, there's no Google places. No one knows that this exists, right? No reviews. Right? So are people going to come? How are people going to know about this? And then Ibrahim is like in shock. He looks around like, okay, well, if I invite them, how are they going to hear? Where would my voice, you know, be received? And it's reported in At-Tabari from Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhumah that Ibrahim said, Our, Oh Lord, how can I convey to the people when my voice will not reach them? It was said, call them and we will convey it. Right? So you just have to make the call. We'll take care of conveying it. So Ibrahim, he stands up and he declares, O oh mankind, your Lord has established a house, so come and make pilgrimage to it. Now in At-Tabari, it's reported that the mountains lowered themselves and the earth was flattened in that moment in order for his voice to reach every region of the globe. So to reach every pocket and every location, and even those that were still in the wombs of their mothers and in their father's loins would hear that call. Now that means not only those who were all alive at that time, that means all future people. Right? So this came, uh, the response came from everyone in the cities, the desert, in the countryside, Anyone whom Allah decreed will later on in the future answer that call of pilgrimage until Yom Al-Qiyamah. They said, yes, we're coming. So when you go there for the Umrah and for the Hajj, you are, and you say Labbaik, you have already said Labbaik. Right? Because it has already been recorded. You have an RSVP. Okay? You are, your reservation is confirmed that you're coming, you already answered the call of Ibrahim. Now you're fulfilling that confirmation and carrying it out, right? And this shows also that the outcome and results come from Allah. Because Ibrahim is like, well, they're not going to hear it. Allah's like, don't worry about that. You do your part. You do you, right? Your part is to announce it, and then Allah will take care of all of that. And he gets up and he shouts, And all the people in the world, they hear it. Allah made His voice reach them. And Allah indicates that, وَأَذِّنْ فِي النَّاسِ right? Call the people for us. Some are going to walk. يَأْتُوكَ رِجَالًا 
they will come to you walking with their feet uh, uh, to this place. Some will come on camels, some will come on horses, some will come on donkeys, some will come by air, some will come by sea, some will come by land. Ala kulli dhamiri yatina min kulli fajjin amir. They will come from every pocket and every nook and cranny. They're going to arrive for the pilgrimage. And isn't it true that billions have come? So next time, inshallah, we're going to talk about Ibrahim when he comes to his wife, Sara, and they discuss about receiving visitors. And if we have time, we'll also talk about uh, the miraculous birth of Ishaq, alayhi salam, as well. But we're starting to wind down and get towards the end of the story of Ibrahim, alayhi salam. Um, let's see if we have any questions. We have Zoom open as well. Would like to uh, begin. Assalamualaikum. I have two questions. Number one is that, as you mentioned, you have been mentioning it that Ibrahim al Islam was 86 mm -hmm. uh, when uh, mm -hmm. Ismail was born. Then he was ordered, at what, what was the age of that time, uh, Ibrahim's, not this Ismail's, but we don't know whether he was ordered to um, kill his uh, son Ibrahim or Ismail. But if we will take that he was uh, um, given order to uh, kill um, this Ismail al -Islam. what was the age of uh, Ismail al -Islam sure. at that time? Sure, um, we can just add it together. So, so the thing is, the Quran doesn't mention by name, but we know that it's this Ismail, because it is indirectly mentioned after that Allah says, then he gave him the good news of Ishaq. So we know that it's Ismail, but I just wanted to, want, uh, you know, to discuss that why Allah didn't just mention his name. So I felt that if Allah wanted to mention the name, he would have, and that he didn't mention it just to remind us that we shouldn't get caught up. Because, you know, but like for in the Jewish text, it emphasizes that this is Ishaq because they view Ishmael as secondary to, to Ishaq. But for us, you know, Ismail and Ishaq, they're both great prophets, right? So we're not trying to show that one is better than the other. As far as his age, so he was 86 when he was born. And then Allah says um, that... That means that as soon as he reached the age of strength, so if the age of strength is a teenager, so 30. we can add it together, so Maybe roughly 13. it will be getting close to 100 years old at that time. Now what is the age of Ismail? This um, Ismail, yes. Yes, Maybe so he's a teenager at that time. Maybe 13, 14. Right? That's exactly right, yeah. Uh, so my, the other question is that... Uh, about the commitment, about our commitment to Allah, that sometimes we say, oh, we are going to fast so many, so many days, mm -hmm. Mondays, Thursdays, if Allah will write our commitment to Allah. But if we cannot fulfill, what is the compensation? So I always recommend people that you should just make the intention or that you should, uh, that, that you plan to do something good. Because there are very technical rules that will go on the case, you know, on case by case analysis for the compensation of another. Another is if a person makes an oath that I will definitely do such and such action. So people, I think they should try to avoid it because there's no need to make any oaths. You know, if you can avoid it, I mean, what are you getting out of that? You know, also, you don't want to be in a position which you're like, oh, Allah, if this happens, then I'm going to do this. I mean, it's like, it's like you going down the road of negotiations, right? You know, it's not like deal or no deal. You know, just ask Allah for what you want. But sometimes we might, in because of out of uh, our dire need and because we want a response from Allah uh, fervently, so we might make. Uh, an, an oath. If you are able to fulfill the oath, then you should fulfill the oath. But if you are required to break that oath, then there is a compensation that is due. So what is the compensation? This is a whole chapter subject. So, so if somebody comes 
with a specific situation. Actually, the best thing would be in if somebody has a specific question on Tuesday with the Ask Dr. Tariq. Yeah, yes. But the thing is, when we come with such a large sub, sub so if mm -hmm. we ask the question on Tuesday, it should be, it has to be more specific because there are different types of of oaths and mm -hmm. what the what the oath is for. Mm -hmm. So it has to be a little bit more specific. Mm -hmm. And then I think he will be able Thank to you. give the answer, inshallah. This is a plug, by the way, on Tuesday we have Ask Dr. Tariq, so please join it. I love Ask, everybody knows, that's like my favorite program we have. We always get fireworks. <laughs> Wa alaikum. Wa Um In today's halakha, you describe the relationship between Ismail and his father, which is very different from the one Ibrahim has from his father or father figure. Um, and the difference being, you know, what brings you closer to Allah right. and the diff when you can disobey your parents or not. So my question is a little more nuanced. In today's day and age, when can children disobey their parents? Um. Yeah, I mean, this is a tough and difficult topic that all the imams try to avoid. <laughs> I mean, to be frank, we try to avoid it because people have a hard time with nuance, right? Because whenever Birr al-Walidain, you know, the, the standard recording that you hear about Birr al-Walidain is obey your parents, right? But Birr al-Walidain is, is is not really teaching people to be robotic. And there are instances in which what your parents are asking you can be damaging or can be harmful, right? Or they might, and it's not a binary thing. It's not just like, you know, it's how often would it be that your parents are gonna tell you to like commit shirk, right? That's not the scenario that people are getting, but there might be scenarios in which you have uh, uh, parents that, um, are affecting your career and other or personal relationships. And so for sometimes people feel kind of stuck between their spouse and their parents, you know, between obligations to their children and to their parents. And so what the what some of the scholars have said is that obedience to parents is with regards to things that pertain to them, right? So if there's something that your parents are asking you for that is for them and you're able to fulfill it, then you have a duty to do so. Right? So if your parents ask you, like, you know, uh, you know, come visit, for example, and you're able to visit and you refuse that request, so then that is an act of disobedience to your parents, right? And, and that, is, that, is a, that is a sinful act because you're able to do so and it is something for them. But if your parents, if parents, you know, especially in different cultures, parents sometimes go outside of their sphere and in some cases can take over or micromanage their children's lives, right? And so this is outside of Birr al-Walidain because now they're asking you for things which is outside of their purview. And so there really isn't, there's a split difference of opinion that should a person obey their parents as to those matters. There are some that, that say that you should obey your parents in all matters as long as it's not something which is sinful. But I tend to think that um, there are cases in which parents um, go to excess and overdo it. But that's very hard because if we give that message, then people are going to think like, oh, so we don't have to uh, show righteousness to our parents. It's so nuanced and so gray that this is why typically you wouldn't hear that message from the scholars, but only if you delve really deep into the literature, then you'll see that discussion among the scholars as to what are the limits, because there are limits to everything, right? So what are the limits of obedience to parents? Right? But most people are not too devout. I mean, this is like life experience. I mean, how many people out there are like too devoted to their parents? Usually most of us fall short. We're, we're not devoted enough uh, in pleasing our parents. And so that's why people lean more on that side. I hope I answered that completely, inshallah. Is that good?
Okay. There's also a question here from Sister Shanaz. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Do the Shi'i also record the stealing of the black stone at his, as it is mentioned? Okay, so I just want to caution everybody. This is not something that was done by the Shi'i. Okay, this is an extreme militant group, one of the most extreme groups in Islamic history. Very, very small number of people. They are a small subgroup of Ismaili, this Qarami, they don't even exist now. So it's not like, oh, you guys did it. There's nobody to point to because they don't exist. And there are, uh, Ismailis are not accepted by the Ja'fari, Ithna Ashri, Shiaris, and then nobody accepts this group. So we should just be clear about that. So we don't attribute this to, this has nothing to do with Sunni or Shia or anything. It's just, it's an extreme group. And the only reason they stole the black stone was they wanted people to come. They didn't intend to destroy the black stone. It was just, you know, they wanted people to forget about the Kaaba right, and go to Masjid Diyar. Um, so do they record the stealing of the black stone? So these are not mentioned in religious texts. So a lot of what I've shared today are historical accounts, right? And there are different, uh, I mentioned Al-Tabari, Ibn Kathir. Um, we mentioned the a book of uh, history by Qutbuddin. So these are the sources that, these are historical accounts, right? These are not religious sources. So could you elaborate on their history and perspective? So uh, the sources that we mention, and this is very, uh, this is very important, is that, you know, these are historians. So they don't belong to any Sunni or Shiari, or they don't belong to any group. They're just, they're fulfilling, uh, you know, their duty as a historian. Even Imam al-Tabari, he, he writes in his introduction, at tarikh al-Tabari, that I threw everything in here, you know, I, every detail, right? So whether it's authentic, inauthentic, even things that as Muslims, we definitely believe cannot be true, Right, it's all included, and that's because, and 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 Dr. Tariq mentioned that in the Friday khutbah. I think most of us were here, in which he talked about how we have collections of the mawdu'at. We have preserved all the weak hadith because we don't want to hide anything. We need to impart our tradition from generation to generation, even the things that we know for sure have been fabricated. So there is a historical record. And so that's why a lot of what's mentioned, this is found in the historical records. And so we should not allow that bias. So it should not be like, oh, this is a Sunni scholar. This is a Shafi'i, this is a Hanafi. No, information is information. So it should be the same sources across. Uh, any others? Yes. Jazakallah khair, assalamu alaikum. Wa I have comment about <coughs> parents and, and children, how they obey them, and then I have a question. If you, I'll be brief. So I think the distinction like children should uh, obey what the parents um, need from them or something related to the parents only might be limited. Uh, because that, if we make that distinction, it means it's related how mature the child, how, how old is he to make the judgment in his own. There's something, let us say if I guide my son about the school, although this is related to his future. So I, but there are areas, I mean, you could say it's limited. For example, if my son became um, adult, he's mature in certain area, this is his area of expertise, I think to me, the lesson that I should not go in that area and I should, I mean, he's knowledgeable, this is his area, I should not make a demand, demand related to that. But I would not make it general because otherwise it might open the room there, like what's the age, whether he's mature enough or sure. so just a um, comment. I think the other point, which uh, my question is related to Sayyidina Ibrahim and Ismail alayhim salam When I come to the ayah in Surah Al-Baqarah, Bismillah, it says, وَإِذْ يَرْفَعُ إِبْرَاهِيمُ الْقَوَاعِدَ مِنَ الْبَيْتِ وَإِسْمَعِيلِ Ismail came later and it took about Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam يَرْفَعُ الْقَوَاعِدَ So that Ismail came later. But when it come 
لا آية بفور ذات قبل آية سير وعهدنا إلى إبراهيم وإسماعيل أن طهر بيتي للطائفين والعاكفين والركع السجود So there is the two of them could come and talk about طهر بيتي versus the other one it says I don't know if you could comment on that although they have that question mark Sure. So on the first point, I think this is very well taken. It relates to the question from Sister Aram, that going back to the question of disobedience to parents, what if your parents are threatening to disown you if you perform a certain fard obligation? So this, this then it will be simple. Right? So we're not going to disobey uh, our creator in obeying a created person. And also it's mentioned in Surah Luqman. وَإِنْ جَاهَدَاكَ عَلَىٰ أَن تُشْرِكَ بِي فَلَا تُطِعْهُمَا Then don't obey them in that act of disobedience. But the point that you're bringing about education is very well taken because there will be cases which kind of overlap, you know. And, and, and this is why it's important for that relationship to be healthy between children and their parents in which children are taking the counsel and opinion of their parents and parents recognizing that you're not the one going to medical school. If you're pushing them like, go be a doctor, like they're the ones that actually have to do it and they have to want to do it. And that if you pressure them and they're like, yes, I will do it because you've guilt tripped me, right? Then later on, they're gonna fail out because there's no passion and they're not interested and they're just doing it out of a sense of duty or obligation. So, you know, the religion is teaching respect and honor um, and all of that and bir, righteousness, um, but it's not turning people into robots, right? And so I, I don't know that there is a full appreciation of that in some of the Muslim societies because what ends up happening is that, you know, in some places it's like, well, I'm your parent, so you have to listen to me. Um, but there is a gray area, especially when they're younger. I mean, when they're younger, I think it falls more within the purview of the parents, clearly. But there, there should be a recognition by parents that you will advise them, you will counsel them, give them recommendations. And parents, they always do that intuitively. Parents give advice forever. They never stop, right? Um, but that people should make choices about their own lives, right? So as long as there's a healthy recognition on both sides, then the relationship goes smoothly and easily in a way that's pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My point was that sometimes uh, parents should facilitate that, right? Because sometimes they make it difficult, right? Because they have certain preferences and they want to impose that on their children. So, you know, that causes that sets up the scene for conflict. And in many cases, it can be avoided. Any yeah, other questions? Okay, I was saying, if you use it, pick up, whatever they, whatever they say, yeah. accept, and they deviate it from the path of Allah. Yeah. And then, you have to accompany them with kindness. Yeah. With kindness, with faith. Rahim Allah, fi dunya ma'arufa. There's a question. Do you have any comments about the question about Sayyidina Ibrahim? Oh, yes. I'm sorry. So uh, in the ayah that we shared in Surah Al-Baqarah, it escaped me. Um, so, so this wow, right? وَإِذْ يَرْفَعْ إِبْرَاهِيمُ الْقَوَاعِدَ مِنَ الْبَيْتِ وَإِسْمَعِيلُ So I think maybe because there's so many words, so then it made you feel that there's a lapse of time. But there isn't. Because وَإِذْ يَرْفَعُ وَإِسْمَعِيلُ So this is wow al-atf. Wow al-atf means conjunction. So when Ibrahim raised and Ismail also raised, wa Ismailu, right? So the two of them are the fa'il. So it's ma'atu. So Ibrahim and Ismail, it's happening contemporaneously. So there's no time period lapse here at all. Yeah, they're together. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. That's correct. So it's Ismail Rabbana taqabbal minna. In Surah Al-Baqarah. There's two verses. Yeah, and the, the, the two verses are saying the same thing. But one mentions the dua first and one, yeah. Yeah, but like the first one, 
Ismail. I mean, the way it might be more emphasis in Sayyidina Ibrahim. Yes, there yes, is more emphasis on Ibrahim. And then it comes, yes. Sayyidina Ismail, later. Yes, versus but not other. later. But not later. Well, like the next step, what I meant. Later not in not the sentence, in term yeah. of time. Sure. What I meant yeah, yeah, yeah. in term of prior, uh, not, not in time, but they are together. But there is more emphasis in Sayyidina Ibrahim. Yes. Right. Versus the other one, when it talk about Watahira, Wahidna Ibrahim or Ismail, both of them. Antahira, they came. Antahira, they came jointly. And I, I do not know whether that, in a way, there is more to say, given to Sayyidina Ibrahim السلام, when it comes to the building of the house. This is what I meant. I mean, I know the wall is Atif. I mean, yeah. I could say. جاء فلان ومعه كذا كذا right. and some, someone something else had sure. uh, so that's sequence but we are giving more importance mm. to the first um, citation compared to the other sure I think mm. that's fair I, I agree with what you said I think that uh, there is more emphasis on Ibrahim uh, when it comes to the building of the Kaaba uh, because uh, you know Ismail is, is helping Ibrahim that's why we call it Maqam Ibrahim that's why we say that the Kaaba was built by Ibrahim, because you know his son is assisting him. It's a joint uh, joint project, but uh, it's primarily attributed to Ibrahim, and this is the way that it's related in the Quran. But then when it meant Antahira Baytiya, so it's it's two of them. So that's why the dual form kicks in. Uh, the yeah, sure. Did you have the microphone? Assalamu alaikum, Jazakumullah khair. Now, here it says, Wa'ahadina ila Ibrahim wa Ismail and Tahira. The way I'm reading it, and uh, I mean, it's a question. It's like this is a continuous thing. Yeah. While the other one is, they are building it once. Right. So basically, if uh, Sayyidina Ibrahim is coming and going, mm -hmm. yeah. Ismail is taking care of it while he's away and so on. I think this is an excellent uh, answer. Because the first, this is in Surah Al-Baqarah, uh, I mean, in the first ayah, وَإِذْيَرْ فَعْرْ إِبْرَاهِيمِ It's talking about the, the building it, which now it's been constructed, so it's done. At the same time, yeah. while the other one is continuous over time. That's right. To today, basically, we are Tahira, basically day. That's right, that's a continuous action. I like that, that's a, that's a good yeah, answer. I, I, I like that as well. I mean, yeah. It might be an indication of the follow-up. Sure. And he's the one who's there, you know, because Ibrahim does not live in, in Mecca. Ismail is the one who but lives the, there. Yeah. Yeah. But, but building the Kaaba, I think, in the same line, like to come. Sayyidina Ibrahim is done, like first of all, and then the continuation. But I agree yeah. that it's well happened already. We were yeah. there. Yeah. So the time to be, if the fact of the sentence that Ismail came back with it, like coming mm. with his error, right. or the, they're helping each other and building it. That's right. That's right. But I think the one is the Ismail Ibrahim in the time of Haiti. Allah took two of his sons. The Tahir of Haiti, the Qa'ilin of the Hir is in Qibad, in Qa'ilin. Qa'ilin, in Sudud, yeah. Yeah. Is yeah. yeah. it both of them together? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Alhamdulillah. So. Well, in the same way, the building is given to Sayyidina Ibrahim and Tahira for both. Kind of project. Because they are together. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, the moral of the story, it's a father, it's a dynamic duo, you know, it's Batman and Robin, father and son, right? So you can separate it, right? We, we tried to separate it, but you can't, because the two of them, they did it together, and Ibrahim is the, is the you know, uh, as the Jewish people say, is the patriarch, right? So he's the, you know, the leader. So of course, Ibrahim is, you know, Ismail is a young teenager, and Ibrahim is Ibrahim, Khalilullah. So there's a difference, but 
both of them did it together. It was a joint project. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us in that example and keep us steadfast. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, make our, facilitate us to visit his house, to make umrah, to make hajj, and to make pilgrimage, and to have hajjan mabrurun, wa sa'yan mashkurun, wa dhanban maghfura, and all of our sins forgiven, and we return back in a state of purity. Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka anta as-sami'u al-alim, wa tub alayna ya mawlana innaka anta tawabur rahim. As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.